Hello. I'm Monique Bork with the Oregon Secretary of State's Office of Small Business Assistance. This video will provide you with an overview of state and local taxes for businesses. Chris Cox, Payroll and Withholding Outreach Coordinator for the Oregon Department of Revenue, will talk about the common taxes for business owners and figuring out which taxes apply to your business. Samantha Williams, who is a business and property appraiser for Yamhill County's Assessor's Office, will be covering local taxes and the business personal property tax. Both Chris and Samantha have great advice on finding a good tax preparer and getting more information about the taxes to which your business is subject. First, I'll be speaking with Chris Cox. All right, so Chris, what are some of the most common taxes for a business owner? So a business will have to report their income at the end of the year and may need to make estimated deposits throughout the year. Uh, based on how they are structured, there are certain income and or excise tax filings associated with different types of businesses. So a sole proprietorship or a single member LLC would complete a Schedule C along with their IRS Form 1040. For Oregon, they would report the results of the Schedule C on the correct form OR40 that applies to them. And then again, more information can be found on Oregon.gov forward slash DOR, which is our permanent revenue website, or they can also go to IRS.gov, which has a lot of helpful information on the IRS side. For a partnership, they would complete a form OR65, and that's used to report partnership income and then depending on how much income each partner has, then it flows through to their personal income tax and they're taxed individually based off that. And then for a corporation, the appropriate OR20 should be filed, depending on if they're structured as an S corp or a C corp. Most small businesses probably would be an S corp. And then entities with a substantial uh, gross receipts may also be subject to a corporate activity tax, which is a separate tax that got introduced a couple years ago. Businesses operating in the TriMet metropolitan area or the Lane Transit District may be subject to transit taxes. Uh, businesses where owners officers are not considered employees of the business will typically file and pay transit self-employment tax on portions of wages earned in the district. So if a business has employees, whether officers of a corporation or other employees, then that business will be subject to payroll taxes. And that may include state unemployment insurance, state withholding tax, statewide transit tax, and workers benefit fund, depending on where the work is being done. We also collect for two transit districts. So we collect for the TriMet, which covers the greater metro, uh, Portland metropolitan area and lane transit, which is centered in the Eugene Springfield area and extends outward to include most outlying population centers in the county. There's also a couple other transit districts that are handled um, by the, in, the entity themselves. So Wilsonville has one, South Clackamas has one, Canby has one. So you know, there is some other ones that we do not um, handle here. How do I know which taxes apply to my business? This question is um, it's kind of more than just taxes. It's really kind of like starting a business or just making sure that your current business is, um, you know, on the right path. What I'm going to go over kind of will help out with starting a business or even if you're currently on a business, you just want to make sure that uh, you're doing the right thing. So we have a publication here in the state of Oregon. It's called the Oregon Start a Business Guide through the Secretary of State's office. This is a great guide, answers questions on how to get started, answers questions about taxes applied to your business. It asks questions that the business owner can start thinking about, okay, maybe I need to reach out to my local city or the county. And it really gets the person thinking of what questions to ask and possibly where to get that information. If you're going to have employees, there's also another guide. The Oregon Employer's Guide contains many answers to questions concerning payroll taxes, 
the IRS also has information on their website of irs.gov because basically it's twofold. You have the federal and you have the state. The Department of Revenue has a lot of information considering taxes we administer on our website, which is oregon.gov for slash DOR. We administer many specialty taxes that apply only to certain types of businesses, such as heavy equipment, rental tax, marijuana tax, hazardous substance tax, lodging tax, and others. If you want to see a full list, we, it can be found on our website, but speaking with a tax professional may be advisable as business situations vary greatly. What are three things you really want to communicate to viewers? Uh, great question. So the first one, know what filing and payment requirements are required for your business and when to file and pay. If hiring out tax filing or payroll, educate yourself and verify that your obligations have been met, been met rather than assuming somebody else is taking care of, of this for you. Second thing, avoid filing or paying late because most of the time there will be penalties and interest for doing things late. And then the third is ask questions when you don't know. We are here to serve you. How can someone find a qualified tax preparer? So web searches, referrals, and other businesses that use a tax preparer are possibly a good starting point. It is always good to check reviews of anybody and ask questions. We can't refer people to a specific private business because it would show that we are favoring one business over another. We can caution, however, that many tax uh, preparation firms are only as good as the information you provide to them. So make sure you are thorough and complete with the information you provide. Um, one example is that transit payroll taxes are frequently impacted by businesses not ensuring a payroll company is aware of the need to file them. How can the public get more information? So if you have more questions, the payroll and withholding division can be contacted via email at payroll.help.dor at dor.oregon.gov or by phone at 503-945-8100. Thank you, Chris. This is really helpful. No problem. Now that we've discussed state taxes of which you need to be aware, we'll turn to a particular tax that many Oregonians don't know about or are confused by, the business personal property tax. For this information, we'll be hearing from Samantha Williams, business property appraiser in the Yamhill County Assessor's Office. The information Samantha offers applies to all counties, not just Yamhill County. Samantha, thank you for joining me. Let's start with the basic questions. So first of all, what is the business personal property tax and how long has it been around? So the first part of this is really kind of a two part question. So there's personal property tax and then there is also a machinery and equipment tax. Those are both kind of in that same component. They affect our businesses. Uh, so the personal property tax is a tax on the tangible assets of a business. So if a business owns any assets, um, those assets are taxable. This does not include intangibles, so those are not part of the statute. And when we think of personal property assets, think of the things that are mobile in a business. So the things that are easily and readily movable. So for example, decor, office, desks, chairs, computers, printers, all those things make up a business. And without those things, the business could not operate. And so the state of Oregon has decided that those assets would be taxable. The second part of that is that machinery and equipment. So some businesses will also have machinery and equipment. So a way to think about this is all businesses will have personal property in some form. Some businesses will also have machinery and equipment. Machinery and equipment is the big things. They're erected upon, affixed to the real estate. These things are plumbed or wired in. 
they're so big that maybe they're in place by their own sheer weight. They're not easily or readily movable. So when we think of the, that type of equipment, we're thinking maybe some of our really big wine tanks, uh, those would be in place. That's equipment the business needs to operate. Um, they can't operate without them. And so that equipment is also taxable. We've we've really got is is the category of business property. There's those two subcategories. We have personal property and the machinery and equipment. Um, how long has it been around? So um, kind of a fun little tidbit. Oregon Historical Society states that the beginning of American taxation for the Pacific Coast started in 1844 in Oregon with a Sheriff Meek. Um, at that time, he was collecting a tax on all males 21 and over, and they levied a personal property tax of one-eighth of one percent on everything. So whether it was a saddle, your horse, your pocket watch, your couch, if it was personal property, it was taxed. This was most mostly in the Willamette Valley. And at that time, there was actually no penalty for not paying your taxes. If somebody refused to pay the tax, the only downside that they really saw was that they couldn't take advantage of Oregon laws that were, of course, fast moving at that time and, and new stuff coming in and out, and they couldn't vote. But other than that, there wasn't any penalties or fees or jail time or anything like that. This tax largely affected our merchants. Um, so Hudson's Bay Company, that was huge at the time. The Methodist Mission and then uh, individual merchants. You might recognize some of the names, George Abernathy, John Couch, John McLaughlin, and F.W. Pettigrew. Eventually, Oregon put forth an amendment to that. And they said, okay, we're not gonna tax your horse and your pocket watch and your couch anymore but we are gonna to continue to tax the business assets. And so it, it, from its inception, it really has not changed that much. So since 1844, the law has been in place and there has been a taxation on business assets it, it, basically from beginning. And several times you've mentioned intangibles. What would count as an intangible? So there's actually a statute that dictates what the intangibles are. Some examples would be stocks that a business might have. The name, you know, you can't tax the name. You can't tax the copyright. You know, those things are intangible. They, you can't touch them. So the tangibles would be really the, the touchable assets, if you will, to really break that down. So when we, we think of those items being for sale or not for sale, in the intangible versus the tangible, something that I have found with personal property or business property in general is that there's a lot of gray, right? So we often think of shipping something that we're paying freight on. That would be an intangible. However, for personal property, freight is taxable. So um, our wineries see this a lot. They get a big order of wine barrels from overseas that freight that they're paying to bring those wine barrels over that is taxable setting up equipment i earlier i had mentioned large equipment it's not just the large equipment it is everything that goes into getting that piece of equipment into place so it could be if we're talking about a big wine tank um, and maybe a glycol chiller they're going to need a electrician in there to put everything together electronically. They're going to need um, maybe a plumber in there to get all the different um, hoses and, and whatnot all put together. So all those, it's the cost to get that item in place. So even though those are technically intangibles, this is one of those gray areas where those costs also have to be reported for taxation purposes. What's the best way for someone to get an understanding of what they should report and how? There's a lot of resources out there. There is one short video, it is available on our website, that very broadly explains personal property. It goes over 
really just the bare bones of what personal property is and what the requirements are. Um, it's a great starter piece, but I would always also refer people back to our website where we have much more in-depth materials there that you can really start peeling into what needs to be reported, what doesn't need to be reported, because there's a lot of things out there that might fall under the exemption category. It goes further into the tax return and all the different schedules on the tax return. And even if you're in a different county, the rules that are made that support business property are made by the state. It's not the counties that make up the rules. So the rules that we're all abiding by across the state the information on our website is going to support that. The only difference would be how we all operate our programs. So how I operate the program for Yamhill County is going to be different than somebody who's operating their program in Polk County or Benton County. So it's always best to contact your assessor's office to get their information. But if you're really just looking for, you know, an overview of what personal property is and what does and doesn't need to be done, those resources are out there. And I would always tell people start at our website. If someone has questions about how to evaluate the property that's being reported, what should they do? The business owner does not value their property. What the business owner is doing when they are reporting on the tax return, and it, there is a specific form, the OR-CPPR, Oregon Confidential Personal Property Return is what all that stands for. The tax return is asking for very specific questions. So what is the item? It's a desk. What year did you purchase the item? I purchased it in 2022. And how much did that cost? It's not asking for value. It's asking for cost. So I, I paid for that desk $500. With that information, people in my position across the state, we get these on the tax returns. We look at that and each asset is given a depreciation table. That depreciation table comes from the Oregon Department of Revenue. And that table basically states that what year span, what time span every asset out there has. So a desk would be a 15, a computer is a five, a printer is a five, but a little bit different. Um, and so what we do is, is the people in this position is we assign that depreciation table to every single asset that's getting reported across the state. And with that information, there's math behind that. So we take the year that the item is, we take that cost and we're multiplying it by the factor, the depreciation table that it matches up with. That number afterwards is the value. And so when all of that information gets entered for one business into our system, whether it's our system or a different county, it all gets into the system. It tallies up all those different assets that they're reporting. So again, remember, it's all tangible assets. So the first year business is reporting, they can have a really big asset list. And so that system will tally up all that and that ending value is what they're taxed on so a business owner does not have to try and figure out what their value is as a matter of fact i tell my business owners don't bother it's it's a waste of their time they they are going to be much better off focusing that extra time on their business um, it's part of our job duties as appraisers across the state, uh, whether they're an appraiser like my position is, or whether they're a tech or whatever level their county has them at, that's part of our job. And so um, that ending value comes out, and then that value is then shifted over to the tax side of the office, and rates are applied. So at the end of it all, we wind up having the tax bill that goes out. What's the deadline for the business personal property tax? The deadline is a hard deadline. It didn't used to be. So it was originally due earlier in maybe March. They shifted it into March 15th, but then they said no extensions. And what that means is that after March 15th, if a return comes in, they are getting penalties and the penalties are in statute. What that means is that 
a business can't call up the assessor's office and say, hey, I'm late and I'm sorry. I really didn't mean to be late. This is the reason. There's there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Our hands are tied because the way that the statute is written. And so there are three penalty phases. The first penalty is 5%. The second penalty is 25%. And the third and final penalty is 50%. And this is of the tax. If your tax bill is $500, you're getting a up to a $250 penalty because your tax return was late. So it's that hard deadline is a serious one. And it's super important to get that tax return to us no later than March 15th. Assessor's offices do accept uh, postmarks on this. You know, don't wait to the last second. Get it in before March 15th if you can. Um, but if you're going to have to wait until the 15th, make sure that you're walking it in and you're getting that postmark that day. Where can a business owner get more information about the tax? You know, as we alluded to earlier, I, I think the most comprehensive information um, I can proudly say is on our county website. And we've also broken our information down into not just personal property, but also personal property in certain types of businesses. Uh, we have information about farming specifics. I mentioned wineries. We've got wineries and vineyards. Farming for our marijuana businesses out there and what the difference is between farming and processing. We've got logging information, just a, a plethora of, of good, good materials. Is there anything else that you think is really important to communicate to folks who might be watching the video? The only thing I could ever really stress is when in doubt, just call. You know, we, I hear so many times that people, they receive something in the mail from us. And they didn't think it applied to them, so they threw it away. I just call. Uh, trust me, if it if it's got your name on it, it likely has something to do with you. Don't throw it away. When in doubt, reach out. We would much rather get somebody on the right track than, like I said, have them either trying to work through a return that it maybe they feel is too complicated or they're not sure how to do it. Um, I would much rather answer questions on the phone or if they came into our office and help them get a better understanding of what they what they need to do and how to do it. Um, because number one, it might save them money in the long run. Um, but when they have a better understanding of this component with their business, they can use this information to guide other pieces of their business. Um, a great example is how the return works and each schedule works. When they have a better understanding of how that return works, they can then look at their purchasing habits and they can actually mitigate their tax to some degree. Um, so, you know, I, I always tell people if you've got a question, even if you think like, well, it's not really a normal question, but maybe just reach out. I'm, I would much rather take a few minutes to help them, you know, get through that question and have good, substantiating, valid answers than have them guessing their way through it. Thank you again for making time to talk to me, Samantha. I'm sure viewers will find this information helpful.